Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome to Liz Live. Let's talk it out. All of your questions about relationships and mental health answered. Today, we have some really exciting topics. We're going to talk about infidelity. We're going to talk about personality disorders. And um, my lovely producer, Tia, is here with us today. And she's been working very hard the last two weeks to gather all of your questions we've been getting so we've what over a hundred questions we got over a hundred over a hundred questions we got from you guys i am so excited and these questions are great questions so they all came in this week and we're going to try and get to as many of them as possible so how are you this week oh i'm wonderful (laughs) i know (laughs) we've had a lot going on between the flu we were sick we had different all kinds of things going on the last two weeks so um, we're all feeling much better and just happy to be here and be alive today. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> so, um, so Tia, I thought, you know, you and I were talking off camera last, last time you were here about personality disorders. And whenever it is that I do my little podcast during the week on mm-hmm. personality disorders, people go crazy. They get the highest number of views. Um, I get the most comments. So I thought today that we could open up that topic and if people have questions about personality disorders um, that they can, you know, chime in and you can. That's perfect. And I think that's such a good topic because I think everybody out there kind of wonders, hmm, I don't know if this person's quite right or not. That's right. I know in a lot of different fields, people can use that to help them. That's right. Determine behaviors and you know absolutely i mean it's not just about marriage it can be your mom it could be your boss it could be your best friends and you just don't understand some of these bizarre behaviors and a lot of times we write them off and we say well you know that's just you know that's just the way joe is you know he had a tough upbringing or something but sometimes the behavior gets so pathological and um it's that it's stunning when you're in a relationship especially a romantic relationship with someone who has a personality disorder and that is something that i see a lot of in my practice i can imagine so i thought we'd start off by um you know just talking about what personality disorders actually are okay okay so i i have a little prop here I have my um, DSM-5, which our lighting is really weird today. Yeah, here, and me, maybe maybe some, let me hold that. You want to hold, hold that? Okay. Nice angle. Yep. So the DSM, actually that's the DSM-4. We now have the DSM-5 out. But the DSM-4 is your Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that all therapists, um, psychiatrists, and psychologists use. And in this book, and it's you can see, I don't know if you can see on screen, it's but Tia, you can see it's a book. thick book. And pretty much everything that's in this book, and this is very important to understand about personality disorders, okay? Everything in this book is considered temporary and treatable, okay? So in other words, if you come in with depression, okay, and you come in and I diagnose you with depression, it's been scientifically proven through research that with medication or therapy or a combination thereof that we can arrest your symptoms and you won't be depressed anymore. And it even goes so far um, as to talk about schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, all of those things are considered temporary and treatable, okay? But there's this little teeny tiny section in this book, okay? And I'm going to show you how tiny it is. Um, If you would just maybe hold this, it's just this little section, okay? I don't know if you can see it. Okay. Just this little skinny, just this little skinny section is personality disorders, and personality disorders different than mental disorders are considered lifelong, pervasive patterns of behavior that begin in early adulthood and continue to develop um, throughout life. Okay, within the personality disorder section, there's three clusters: A, B, and C. Not important for anyone to remember, but. Cluster B personality disorders are the ones that everybody out there wants to hear about. That's narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and then there's two others in cluster C that are not important, so I'm not going to bring them up. Okay. But it's not that they're not important. They're just not things we're going to run into that much. But um, So we have narcissist. We have histrionic and we have borderline. And these are the three that people seem to really run into a lot. Um, So 
when we think of narcissism, have we gotten any questions? I see just something. I just want to make sure if anyone's asking um, anything. It's just it's telling us who's watching. So okay. we have Renee Smith right now watching. Okay, Renee. What's up, Renee? Thank you for watching. Um, so when we're talking about narcissism, um, we're talking about kind of like what it sounds like. Um, if you think of the queen, uh, the what was it, in Snow White, the queen, and she would say, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? For it is I. Okay, so narcissists see themselves before they see anything else in life as important. Um, their own needs and their own desires are always at the top of the list for them. Okay, so when you're in a relationship with a narcissist, you can imagine how frustrating that would be because relationships are reciprocal. They're supposed to be a give and take. Well, narcissists take and take and take. Don't I look nice today? And take, you look gorgeous. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's all, all they do. It's all about me. It's all about them. And statistics show that men are much more likely to be narcissists than women. Really? Yes. That doesn't mean there aren't narcissistic women out there because there's plenty of them, but they tend to fall into the histrionic part. So th we'll get to that in a second, okay? Because a lot of people go, what the heck is a histrionic? Most people don't know that one. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, but we're going to talk about that. So thinking about the narcissist, um, narcissist to be in a relationship with them, to be married to one of them is really a nightmare. I don't know how else to put it. Um, their behavior is so bizarre when you're close to them, but yet to the outside world, they might seem okay. But when you're at home with them, when you're close to them, um, they're very, they tend to be extremely abusive, um, very rageful, um, and they'll rage about weird things. And what they get rageful about usually is anything that has the potential of making them look bad in any possible way. So if you argue with a narcissist, okay, narcissists love politics. They love to latch on to something to be right about, okay? So you, you'll find a lot of narcissists, they never shut up about politics, okay? Just as an example. Hmm. So... Um, they, in their views, if you challenge their views about anything, they will get enraged. Really? They will get enraged. Um, if you try to have a conversation with them about something in the relationship. So if I'm a narcissist and you come to me and say, hey, Elizabeth, you know, I feel like, you know, our friendship is, is fading. You know, you don't really keep in touch. You know, you never you don't call answer me. my texts. I'd be like... No, you're the one who never answers the text. You're the one, I call you all the time and you never answer my text because you're always too busy for me. So let's, okay. And by the way, remember that time last month when you ordered pizza and I said that I wanted Chinese? Yeah, you remember that? That's, you're the narcissist. So they flipped the script. Flipped the script, completely change everything and you're sitting there like in the dust, like what just happened? And this will be always the way it is when you confront them about anything in the relationship, anything in their lives. Hmm. Narcissists come in sort of a range of like really bad to maybe just having some features. But if you notice, um, when you're talking to a narcissist, they never really want to hear what anyone else has to say. Hmm. But they always love talking about themselves. So if you notice when you're having a conversation with a narcissist, and you're talking about you, let's say you're telling a childhood story, or you'll notice them daydreaming, kind of fading. They're really not interested. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in what you have to say. That They're would really, look really not. nice in my house. Exactly. They're not interested. They really don't want to hear about it. Um, they want as much attention as possible. And they'll do anything to get that attention. It could be, again, the rage. It could be. Um, talking really loud so everybody looks at them. It could be, um, you know, having to have a certain type of car and a certain type of clothes. And Now, it doesn't mean that all people who have nice clothes and nice cars are narcissists. That's not at all what I'm saying. No, but, you know, it's the people that point it out. And the people yes, that, oh, they yep, brag. I'm they, buying a new one tomorrow. Right. Guess what I have? You know, I'm a bragger, right? The, the narcissists tend to brag a lot and... Facebook has become, and social media has become a great outlet for narcissists to, you know, talk about themselves and, and, and show, and, and everything, show off. everything off. Right. I can probably think about five or six people 
in my life that I deal with with you now saying that to me that I can spot like yes, right away right away and they tend to be very charismatic so they can really suck you in and you know especially um, when women are getting involved with male narcissists a male narcissist or can be so romantic and so charming and so complimentary and just do what we call love bombing and they'll just love bomb the hell out of you and you think wow what a wonderful guy this guy's amazing and then once they have you under their control then they switch and they become very very abusive very critical they'll put you down um they become extremely selfish and it's almost like you don't count in the relationship and they tend to attract women who are caretakers because this type of woman is looking for a project Yes, or doesn't demand a lot of her own emotional needs, doesn't know how to ask. So she gets into a relationship where she's fulfilling all their needs, and in the end, there's nothing left for her. And that's why most relationships with narcissists don't last very long. Now, is this a treatable condition? No. So it is you not are treatable. What you are. Um, I did a lot of research on narcissism in um, graduate school, and I have a lot of videos that, where I'm talking about it, so I don't want to belabor it too much, but. There's not a ton of research on narcissists um, because narcissists never think they, they have problems. They don't want to reach out for the help. So we never get them. And all of our mental health statistics come from mental health facilities. Okay. So it doesn't take into account the narcissists that come into our private practices. It doesn't take into account the narcissists that don't show up. All we know are the narcissists that check into mental health facilities. And I think... The statistics can never be very good about that because you're never really getting a true accounting of how many narcissists are out there. I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot. Well, and I think our culture is becoming incredibly narcissistic. Um, so, yeah. So we do have a question from Bella. Okay, Bella. Once you dated a narcissist, how do you overcome the fear of dating another one? Well, um, that's a great question. What I would recommend to you, Bella, is make a list of all of the warning signs and red flags that you saw when you were in that relationship, okay? Like really think back to the very beginning and start logging a list of all those things, a list of all of the crazy um events where you know he flipped the script on you he put you down all those kind of things make a big list in a notebook of all those things that happened and really get to know the narcissist and i think you can you know watch my videos you can go to therapy but even if you don't want to come to therapy i think if you make that list in that notebook when you write things down you're thinking you're processing you're becoming very um, familiar and intimate with the personality traits of a narcissist and I would refer to that notebook for the rest of your life <laughs> I'm serious about that keep Until that notebook and when you start dating and you go out on dates go home right after the date jot things down if anything stood out to you weird and see if there's any comparison and you know I think that that's a great way to keep yourself safe without depending on a therapist, you know, to be able to really get intimately familiar with the narcissist. And once you do, once you really get it, you'll never go for that again because it is horrifying. It's traumatizing. Oh, it's, it's, it's horrible. Um, and, th th Bella, I also think that um, if you, you know, you keep that notebook and then come in and talk to me, um, and every time you go on a date, let's process it. You know, let's sit down, let's process it, you know, bounce things off of me. I mean, I'm really good at this topic. I have to, I'm allowed to yeah. say. I mean, oh, I'm, really, yeah, of course. I'm really good at sensing narcissists. <laughs> I can smell them. I, I can smell them. Well. I, I know when they're coming near my door. <laughs> Seriously, I, I know them very well. So you'll be in good hands if you come in and process your dates with me and we can talk about it. Or you could even go on the date, too, and just... Bella, I'll go on your dates Hi. with you, okay? <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll sit on the table behind you and, like, just incognito <laughs> and just listen. Yeah. That would be fun. But um, thank you for that great question. That was a really good really question. Really good question. Why is it so hard to get over a narcissist? The reason it's hard to get over a narcissist is because they are abusive. And when you're, when you're in an abusive relationship, these people who abuse... They traumatize us by going after our and exploiting our most vulnerable, 
person uh, parts of our personality they'll tell you they'll make snide comments about the way you look about how you dress about how you cook about how you live i mean everything they're just always putting you down so they can feel bigger and that becomes very traumatizing especially from someone that you expect love from so you know we can all think back let's say to childhood where one person said one line or called us one name that still sits with us at 34 and 44 years old yep. and so imagine if that's getting constantly told to you reinforced by who's someone who's supposed to be your lover who you you want the love and affection from the most it's very damaging it's very abusive and it's very traumatizing and that is why it's so hard to get over narcissistic abuse um, and it, it, I mean, I've worked with so many beautiful, stunning, smart, kind women um, who have dated narcissists, and it sometimes it takes years. Ugh, it takes awful. years to get over it because they're just so they're so mean. Narcissists are so mean. And then in your mind, I'm sure it just puts you in your own little box. It does. All you do is think about all the negatives that they've said. Absolutely. On repeat. That's right. So when you're getting That's ready right. to go out or when you're even having a conversation like this with anybody, mm -hmm. you're probably thinking, okay, she's like right, judging me. That's right. What's what's wrong with me? Is there something on my shirt? Or, you know, is my makeup not Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Am I pretty enough? Am I thin enough? Am I dressed well enough? Am I too this? Am I too loud? Am I too quiet? Am I that? Because those things have been exploited in you by, again, a person that you expected and anticipated on getting the most love and affection from. So, I mean, I hate to say this, but give yourself a couple years and definitely go to therapy. You have to process the relationship. You have to. I think that's great advice. Yeah. Yeah. It's great questions too. Anything else coming in at the that moment? That was the last one that I have on that topic. Okay. So let's move off narcissists. Okay. And let's go, let's we can get to borderlines in a second, but you asked me a couple weeks ago, what the heck is a histrionic? Because when I hear that, I'm thinking, oh, it's a history buff. They right. know everything about George Washington. They know everything about our United States. That's right. And don't ask me who came up with these labels for all these personality That's, disorders because yeah. I have no idea. But so histrionics, so let me paint a picture of you, uh, for you of a histrionic. Okay. okay? So the classic female histrionic, so where me mostly men are narcissists, although there's a small number of female narcissists, m most histrionics are female. Okay. Okay. And the picture I would paint for you of a histrionic female would be um, that, that woman in the gym or that woman in the restaurant or at the bar or wherever you hang out that is dressed very sexually inappropriate. So that everybody just has to go, huh? So they always have some boobs hanging out, some tush hanging out, um, bright colors, super sexy clothes, you know, lots and lots of makeup. Um, they're the ones that wear like the, the bright pink pants in the gym, right? The super tight pipe. Just stuff that makes men look. Because what they're looking for is male attention. Specifically male attention. So they want that kind of validation. Yes. Like, hey, look at you. And they do everything. It, everything with them is very sexual and very flirtatious. So most histrionic females have zero girlfriends. Maybe one, but zero girlfriends because no women can put up with it. It's just every time you go out, they take over every conversation. They're loud. They're... You know, um, so histrionic, I believe, comes from hysterical. I, so, uh, I, you know, the hysterical woman, which is kind of a negative um, and sort of chauvinistic type of theme that I don't really want to go there, but the histrionic woman kind of descends from that idea. Um, histrionic women, um, they tend to be extremely insecure, but they walk around like, you know, they're the best thing, the ever. best thing that ever happened. Um, they will flirt with your husband right in front of you. They don't care. Um, they'll flirt with anybody anywhere. Um, anything they can do. And I'm painting a picture of the most extreme histrionic, of course. Um, but everything is always... Um, you ever see girls who take like hundreds of selfies 
on Facebook and post them. Uh huh. Or the boomerangs. Yeah, those. I, yeah, those are the new ones. Yeah. The women who just constantly, you know, selfie, selfie, selfie. Probably histrionic. So if I'm out with somebody and they have their phone in their purse and they see themselves in the mirror, this is great light. One second, and then, and next thing you know, they're posting it. It could mean it's a histrionic, not a hundred percent. But you know, now that's almost becoming normal behavior, so it's hard to say. But um, you know, it's yes, it, that's a possibility. But it's women who use their sexuality and their flirtation to communicate. I mean, they don't really. Um, they tend to be very emotional and it's very phony. So, like, if you meet somebody, and go, they seem so phony. They seem so fake, but they're so nice to you. My God, I love you. I love you. You're great. Look at those shoes. But they just met you, or they know yeah. they met you like three times, and then they just, oh, I love you. Um, how can they really love you? Yeah, they, they don't even know a conversation. you. They don't really know you. Yeah. Um, they believe that their relationships are much more close and intimate than they actually are. So, you know, they'll always say, "Oh my God, I'm such good friends with her." Everyone you you mentioned, oh, you know, you know, Jen from you know Squirrel Hill. Oh my God, I'm best friends with her. Meanwhile, they only met them like they twice. met her twice. Yeah. Um, they tend to lie a lot. They tend to um, project an image of, as do narcissists of extreme wealth, extreme beauty, um, you know, the, to, to some of the, you know, very um, sick ones on the high end of the spectrum, I mean, they'll just lie. They'll make up stories about what they do for a living, you know, they'll tell you they were, a, you know, a famous sports player or a famous model. I see, I hear the model from these girls all the time. So I walked the runway yesterday mm -hmm. and then my heel broke and it was so embarrassing. Right. Meanwhile, they maybe work at like the checkout counter at all Correct. Time. So do they just sit there and dream these things up They do. Day? They fantasize unlimited beauty and unlimited wealth. And if you look, if you read about them in the DSM, it goes over all this. In the, in the manual I brought forward, or you can look it up, you know, the DSM online, but you'll see that um, histrionics can cry. They can get mad. I mean, they're you, emotionally, you don't know what the hell's coming next because they're, everything's drama and... It's bigger than life, and it's, you know, it's just a lot. There are a lot to take. Um, again, the loud voices, the look at me, the, you know, how high and can my shoes be and how low can my, my shirt be until I get the attention that I want. They don't talk to you, like, in a regular tone of conversation. They talk, like, in some, some very sort of, I don't know, sexual, childlike way. Like, hi, you know, it's very, they're, they tend to be very like cheerleader-ish. So know. is this like a learned behavior or is this something that you think people are born with? Um, it's, you're definitely not born with it. Um, personality patterns develop from your environment. They develop from experiences. They develop from, you know, maybe watching some other, fam you know, family members who have the same traits. Um, but they largely develop from trauma and abuse in childhood. So you'll find that a very large number of um, women who have been severely sexually abused or something as children wind up to be histrionics. And not all of them, um, but they become kind of like hypersexual. And so um, like if you look at, you know, a lot of, um, you know, I've interviewed a lot of strippers over the years in therapy and um, you know porn stars when I was down in Miami escorts and they were all really severely abused sexually at some point um, they use a lot of drugs and you know it's a very sad situation there but it's um, but the, the histrionic is you know again a descendant of all that now is that one of those things that somebody can with help get over or is it kind of like Person once you're yeah set, personality you're set? disorders is tough if you just have the traits and you're aware of your own behavior and you're honest about it then there's always help but when you're on the very malignant end of these personality disorders no there's i mean again there's very little research but the research we have suggests that they are pervasive, lifelong patterns of behavior that do not change. Now, Bella asked a good question. Do okay. they believe what they're saying? Oh, people ask me that all the time. Um, I think they do. Um, 
I don't know. This is, that's a great question. People always ask me that. Like, do these people really believe what they're saying? Like, the narcissist, the borderline histrionics. I think... If this makes any sense, I think that in the moment when they're saying it, they believe it. They, they're 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 living like in this fantasy. But I would I would have to assume, and I don't have proof, but I would have to assume that somewhere deep inside, they know it's not true. You know, I mean, I once saw somebody um, s- say that they were a model. You know, I once saw someone say that they were a surgeon when they weren't. I saw someone say that they were a lawyer when they weren't. I mean, they want to they want that but they didn't attain that and so they create a fantasy as though it actually happened and then they believe the lies i think when they're coming out but i think at night when they go home somewhere there has to be a lot of shame about that it's like a dark place it's a very dark place that they would never show anybody so they start having a conversation with you and then if they feel like you're not as interested as you could be then they start kind of adding this in or do you or do they just start with it right off the bat They'll usually start with it right off the bat. Like, I'll give you a great example. Oh. A couple years ago, I was at an event, uh, a work event, okay? okay. And um, this woman uh, comes into the room, and she's introduced to me. Never met her in my life. Never met her in my entire life. I was with Rob, and we were standing there. We were introduced to her. The first thing out of her mouth was, this is how she introduced herself. To me. Well, I have to be careful of it. Hi, I'm so and so. I'm a best selling author. Okay, great. And I was write? like, well, that's an interesting way of introducing yourself. I'm like, but histrionic, you know. So I come to find out that that wasn't true at all. But maybe she believed that the only way that people at this event would accept her was to make up or embellish, you know, maybe she wrote a book. I don't know. But she had to embellish it and then introduce her. I mean, she didn't even say, like, I would never walk up to somebody and say, hi, you know, I'm Elizabeth. I'm an amazing therapist. And, but she is. You know, and she should. I don't even really tell people what I do. So I can't even imagine walking up to someone and saying, hi, I'm a best-selling this or best-selling You know, that's just a bizarre, that's a histrionic. So they'll, they'll, they'll hit you right over the head with it. Yeah. Now, there's always with these personality disorders – the covert side, the, 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 um, I call it the backhanded narcissist or the backdoor histrionic. I mean, not all histrionics will dress sexy necessarily, but they might just have those really, really exuberant, overwhelming personalities and, you know, are very theatrical and see the intensity of relationships that aren't really there. Yes, all that stuff. But, they might present a little bit differently, especially if you're dealing with older women. You know, they might not dress so sexy, but, you know, they might pile on a bunch of jewelry and have, the, you know, the tons of makeup and shiny clothes or, you know, whatever they can do to stand out in a way as a sex object or just to have all eyes on you. Now, do they ever have meaningful relationships with anybody? Um, some do, some that just have the, some histrionics can, but the the relationships tend to be extremely unhealthy, destructive, and volatile because histrionics manipulate, they lie, they cry constantly to manipulate, um, they act like children, so it's very difficult. I mean, you can have a long-term relationship with one, I've seen it happen, but, um. Because I would imagine at some point you'd have to, the lies would just become... Well, usually whoever they're with will just overlook it, you know. And the histrionics, the histrionic women are so good at manipulating men. Um, I mean, wow. You know, that's interesting to me. So then would they, are they the types of people that would pull all of the attention? Like, say, they're in a relationship. And say you take them to meet your family. Mm -hmm. Are they the types of people that would find something wrong with everybody else in that group to maybe pull you away from them? Or um, that's more borderline behavior, borderline personality disorder behavior. Histrionics would more be like just throwing themselves all over your parents and hugging and kissing them. And I love you. And oh my God, you're like my mom. And wanting their approval. In, in one meeting. Okay. And then if they, if someone was on to that behavior, which often happens, mm-hmm. okay, especially if you're looking out for your son, or your brother or sister, if someone's on to that behavior, then they'll flip it and your mom's a B-I-T-C-H. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. 
Isn't that interesting? You either love the histrionic or they hate you. Very simple with them. So they would pull far enough away to be like, mm, we're good on that and just not put themselves in that situation. If they're not loved and adored, they cannot handle that. It shatters their world. Huh. So they, because they really have zero self-esteem. So it's all fake. It's all a show. They're so big the show So the heels people. and the tight pants or the short skirt, the look at me behavior, maybe the, the edgy looking haircut. Maybe. Huh. Anything that makes them really stand out. But again, you know, I don't want 100 hate emails here. I'm not <laughs> saying that if you dress a little bit sexy or you like fashion or you take care of yourself, that's not a histrionic. The histrionics are the extreme. Yes, extreme. they're the extreme to where you can't help but stare. You know, like I remember one of my professors when he was teaching us about histrionics, he said, okay, class, should you be concerned if a mother of an eight-year-old boy comes in with jean shorts, like a her Daisy ass, Dukes. Daisy Dukes plus and high heels. And um, should you be concerned about that? We're all, especially as females, afraid to answer that question, you know, because we live in an age where women can be beautiful and sexy and all those things, and we shouldn't be judged for that. However, his point was, if you're if you're a mother of a young boy and you're dressing so overtly sexual that it could potentially embarrass the child because it's out of the culture, it's so extreme, should you as a therapist be concerned? And his answer was absolutely. Hmm. You know, to at least ask the question of the mother at some point, you know, do you think that the way you dress has any connection to how people treat you? Um, do you think that, how do you think others perceive you? You know, not to just attack them and, you know, because mm -hmm. you never know someone's story, but to be concerned and inquire about it. I mean, I do. I do. If someone comes in that's just, you know, dressed completely like they look like, just it's too much you know i'm not going to attack them or anything but you know it'll come up it'll yeah. come up it, you'll it, it comes up and i might just challenge them about it and like hey okay you know i see you dress pretty sexy you know um how's that working for you you know? And sometimes it's just their thing. And it's just their thing. And, and we're not saying that everybody is this. It's no. just it's just their preference. It's it's their preference and people should have the right to do and dress however they want. Um but if you're asking me to describe the histrionic, I mean that's a big telltale sign. A big one. So so that's the narcissist and histrionic and we didn't I don't know how we're doing on time. How 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 many how much time? Are Let's we? see. Because I want to give some time for Already the Already 1230. Is it really? Okay, so we were going to talk about infidelity today. Why don't we see if we can pull some of your questions? Okay. And that are maybe connected to infidelity, and let's let's get that conversation going. All right. Let's see what we have here. So basically what we did is we went out and just asked some people, hey, if you have any mental health questions, let us know. Send us an email. Um, these are all totally anonymous. Okay. So this is a safe space for everybody out there. So again, if you want to contact us on the side, you know, any emails or Facebook messages or Instagram messages, we keep your privacy 110%. Absolutely. That is one of the most important things about us doing. That's this. right. And we got 100 questions. I am so excited about this means this is exciting. So all right, hit me with some ones that are um, here. This could be a good one. Okay. This could probably go either way. Okay. My husband seems uninterested with me. When I ask him what's wrong, he tells me nothing, but he continues to show little to no interest in going anywhere, doing anything, and even having sex with me. Help me, please. Okay, so she's suspecting he might be having an affair, but when she asks him, he denies it. Yeah. That's and what it, what and it looks he, like. he doesn't want to have sex with her. Correct. He doesn't want to go anywhere with her. Correct. And doesn't talk to her. D yeah. Basically, from, from what I got in this message. Okay, and she's saying, help me. Okay, um, well, the you know, well, I mean, something's going on, okay? okay. Um, what's going on with him, I don't know. Um, you know, if it's not, an I mean, first of all, if someone's having an affair, usually the first time you ask them, they're going to deny it. Um, so I might ask again, and when you go into this conversation, I think you need to 
go in with being ready to draw some very clear lines in the sand with him because um, silence is domestic violence to me. And so if somebody's just cutting you off and not speaking and you're asking for help and you're asking for them to talk to you and you're not, that's very abusive and it's very hurtful. So I think you need to sit, sit your husband down and lay it on the line that, you know, don't enable the behavior anymore. You know, don't let it go any further because the further you let it go, the worse it's going to get. So you want to, you know, draw some lines in the sand with him and say, listen, you know, I love you. You know, we're a married couple. You know, I'm hurting right now because you're not speaking to me. We're not intimate with each other. You know, you don't even want to be around me. Is it something that I've done or something that I'm doing? Because when you put it, the responsibility on yourself first, you're disarming the other person. Okay. Okay. Because if you go in on the attack and say, you never speak to me, you don't sleep with me, blah, blah, you know, right away, the gloves are up and you're going to have a fight. So if you go in and approach it like a conversation and say, you know, um, you know, we, we love each other, we're married, you know, I miss you, I miss spending time with you, I miss having sex with you, I, I'm dying for that intimacy. Is there something I've done to hurt you? Is there something I'm doing, I've done to cause this? See what his answer is. Okay. If he says no, has nothing to do with you, then I think you need to press him and find out what is it. Did he get in trouble at work? Um, did he have a big fight with somebody? Did he lose a bunch of money? Um, you know, is he using drugs or alcohol? Um, there's something going on there that he's withdrawing severely from you and we need to find out because it's very painful for you to live like this and i think when you talk to him you got to be you have to be very firm about it that you need you need some answers and it might take a couple approaches until you get it out of them okay okay let's see if i catch my husband cheating is there any way to fix the relationship or should i just walk away um if you catch him cheating, yeah, I mean, yes, I, I don't think you have to walk away. I don't think um, that because there's been an affair, you have to walk away. Um, I used to think that before I became a therapist, oh. okay, yeah. because when you're not immersed in that subject like I am on a daily basis, it's very easy to judge it, and it is so painful, and I'm sorry that you're going through this um, because it's unbelievably painful. And it's so painful that you feel like the only thing to do is to walk away. But I would say that before you walk away, come to therapy and um, let's find out what's going on. Because sometimes in long-term marriages, um, first of all, an interesting fact, most people who cheat are not habitual cheaters. And most people who cheat cross that boundary that they even thought they never would okay so sometimes when we're together with someone for a long time a lot of things can build up and i'm not excusing it or saying it's okay but sometimes people do it and you know i see a lot of people in my practice who are ordinarily really great people that have made this mistake and through a lot of work and a lot of dedication and a lot of hard sessions, we can um, make an even better marriage. And I think a dignified way to look at infidelity is to say, okay, this was a warning flag. This was really horrible. Breaks on. We need to go to therapy. We need to figure out what's going on. And see if this could potentially be an opportunity to build an even better marriage. And I've done it with many couples over the years and it does work. So I'm not, I don't think you have to run, but I think that if it's a pattern and there's been multiple affairs, then we got a big problem on our hands. But if it's, if it's a one-time situation, yeah, I think we can work through that. Okay. That was a great question. Very good question. All right. So do we want to maybe move on to some of these other questions that are Yeah, let's off? do that. I okay. want to there's one more thing I want to say okay. about uh, you know on the topic of infidelity um, because it's so painful. Um, and it seems like, you know, it's it's irreparable dam damage. Um, but a lot of times I find and actually I didn't make this up. One of my um, 
one of the marriage and family therapists that I personally look up to and follow her work, Esther Perel, um, she says that what people are looking for in affairs is not other people to be with. They're looking for another version of themselves. And I think that's a really profound um, yeah, I think that way to think about sense. it, that when we th- you know, we tend to think, oh, he's going to go find a, a younger, prettier girl or something or some other woman that can do things that I can't or... He, you know, she's going to go find a guy that's going to do things that I can't. But what they're searching for, what we're all searching for, is to feel alive in our marriages. And it's very hard to feel alive when you're running after little kids and everybody's working and bills are coming in and life is passing you by. We abandon the marriage and we lose ourselves. And in our affairs, it's not so much that we're, we're seeking another human being. We're seeking that better version of ourselves that feeling of aliveness. And so I don't think that that um, that an affair has to be the end of the marriage. In fact, a lot of times I think it would be sad if that were the case. Because there's still a lot of good there. There's so much good. You know, people have long foundations and children and lives and families. And, um, you know, I'm not saying that it isn't something that needs to be dealt I mean, it has to be dealt with. Mm-hmm. It has to be punctuated. It has to be... Um, professionally handled for sure do not try and handle an affair on your own do not won't work um but i i don't think that it has to be the end of the marriage personally. so then i have a question yes why would somebody if they're in a relationship and they're in a great relationship why would they i mean people use the word downgrade but I have seen sometimes where people will go off with somebody other than their husband and wife and it's like a total downgrade. It's somebody totally opposite of what they're married to or what they ever kind of projected that they wanted or mm-hmm. what they've ever dated. Why would somebody do that? Um, I don't know, 100%. Um, Kors has something he wants to say, my dog. Um, but seriously, what I, I think that sometimes we walk around with a lot of guilt and a lot of shame, you know, from things that have resulted from the marriage. Maybe you feel like you weren't a good enough father, or you weren't a good enough husband, or you weren't a good enough wife or mother, or something like that. So the, you know downgrading whatever you want to call it um is because you don't really feel like you deserve or are worthy of that person that you're with so there's no pressure to go with somebody who's let's say mentally distraught or something because there's no challenge there Uh, somebody else just brought up something interesting what about the saying once a cheater always a cheater um well i don't believe that i um Again, before I was a therapist, I believe that. Um, if you're really interested in learning about infidelity, go to um, Esther Perel. She has a book called, um, oh, I forget. Well, one of them is Mating in Captivity, and I think the other one is Life After Infidelity. And her view on that is that, um, again, most people who cheat in long-term marriages are not habitual cheaters. But there are habitual cheaters out there that that term would apply to. Once a cheater, always a cheater. Yes. Most people who cheat, it's so painful when everything comes out, they never do it again. But the people who are habitual cheaters that have multiple affairs during the marriage, those are the people you want to cut and run from. Could that be the state of affairs? Maybe that's what it's called, the state of affairs. Yes. I just looked it up up for everybody out there watching. Um, Her one book, Made in Captivity, is phenomenal I mean I don't like to read I have ADD too much I can't focus but when I picked up this book I couldn't put it down it's really neat though because she does have audiobook options audiobook options I mean Esther Perel is amazing I mean she's she's my idol if I could be as smart as her one day I would be really happy but she's she's got it when it comes to affairs um okay thank you what's the next question okay so now we're kind of moving off of the infidelity topic so Here's a good one that I think a lot of people can relate to. Okay. I have three girls, seven, nine, and 14. Okay. They fight constantly. Okay. When I try to intervene, they start fighting with me. How can I stop this pattern? Hmm. Well, um, the first thing I would recommend is to the mom. Okay. Mom, um, look in the mirror 
and ask yourself, are you A, following through with discipline? Are you just screaming and then not doing anything? Or are you disciplining? Um, because we tend to teach people how to treat us, and that includes our children. So if we don't set really tough boundaries with the little ones, especially three girls. <laughs> Bless you. Drama, drama, drama. <laughs> emotions, emotions, emotions. Drama, drama, drama. Everything's the end of the world. And yeah, um, then they're going to walk all over you. So first step is looking in the mirror. Um, following through with discipline, punishing, having a lot of structure in the house. And I don't know if there's a father present, a father involved or not. Um, is there a grandfather? Is there a male figure that can kind of step in and help you? Um, because if you're a single mom, I mean, th then you have to be mom and dad. And it's just so much pressure. Yeah. And so maybe you need a little help. Um, maybe you need to organize your house a little bit more and really take a new approach to, you know, how serious you're being. Um, and then, you know, some of it is just girls fight. I mean, siblings fight. I mean, that is a part of life. Um, but how far you let it go is going to be how far you let it go. Yeah. Yeah. So, and if you need any more, if you want to get more into it, you know, I'd love to have you come in and, and you know. Please send a message. Yeah, she can and get talk to me and, and, yeah, come in and, and perhaps we can really lay out the land and I can understand the whole picture because okay. I don't have a lot of information on that one. That's a good answer. Okay. Um, okay. Keeping with the, the child theme, mm -hmm. how can I explain death to my six-year-old and what is the best way to help them process? Okay, so um, great question. So I actually started out in childhood bereavement. Okay. So, and I was a bereaved child. Um, my father passed away when I was 11, and um, my little brother was eight. Um, and I worked at the Children's uh, Bereavement Center of Miami for four years and got a lot of great training there. And they always encouraged us. So children grieve differently at different ages. Um, so a six-year-old... Um, understanding of grief is going to be very different than a 15 year olds and so on and so forth so you want to take age into consideration um, what what I was always taught by the top thanatologists in the country was that you want to be as honest as possible with children but don't give too much detail so for example you might say um, you know grandma you know, she got really old and she got sick and her body stopped working and she died. So you want to keep it simple because if you go into these fantasies of, well, the angels took him or God took him away, then kids start to fantasize that maybe God's going to take my other parent away or God's going to take, I mean, you don't want them to have a negative view of God. So it's very t tricky, but if you're just straightforward and honest, that's the best policy at no matter what age. Six, keep it real simple, um, very cut and dry. Um, when people's bodies get very sick, sometimes they die. Done. Um, if they, you know, if they want to ask questions, keep it simple. Try not to bring anything into it. Um, and keep in mind that six-year-olds don't understand the concept of finality yet. So when they are faced with death, you know, to them it's like, well, you know, in a cartoon, you get the cartoon character gets smashed and then they pop right back up. Yeah. And that's how I was taught that little children understand death. They don't get finality and I can remember even at 11 when my father died I was old enough to understand I was never going to see him again but I definitely wasn't old enough to understand the whole thing mm -hmm. you know why him why at his age why did this happen to us where is he going and I used to lay away and wonder where he where he went um, and those are things that we cannot answer for children so we have to be you know kind of just cut and dry about it and, hey I don't know where dad went straightforward I don't know we don't know what happens when people die but we believe that you know he's with his other family members or we believe that he's safe yeah, good question good yeah. an great answer so I think for the last 10 minutes if anybody has any questions I see a couple coming in um, okay we can answer some of sure. those so let's see from Amy my daughter is having a lot of trouble making friends in high school do you have any advice how old is she 
Amy. Um, and Amy, yeah, can you write in how old she is? Um, did she say high school? Or hi, it says, says high school. Oh, it says high school. Yeah. Okay. So that's good enough. Um, okay, Amy. Well, um, you know, again, people want to bash me over the head when I say this, but let's look in the mirror. In other words, not you, Amy, but, you know, let's look at your daughter. Um, you know, why is she having trouble making friends? Is she shy? Does she get bullied? Um, is she different than the other kids? Is she not fitting in? Is she turning on her friends? You know, we need some information um, because I, you know, I wonder why she is having trouble making friends. You know, a lot of teenagers that are my clients tell me that if they're not like all about social media, they have no friends. So maybe she's just more mature and she doesn't want to use that um, particular format to make friends and she's getting left out. Um, maybe there's a mean girl who's turning people against her. Um, you know, we would really have to sit down and talk with her to understand, like, you know, what's going on here, Where what's going on. From. Yeah. Um, but again, I'm available. Um, if you want to bring her in or you want to come in and talk about it, I would like you to bring her because I would like to understand the problem from her perspective. But, um, you know, we can't fix a problem that we don't know the source. The source of it. So I would sit her down and have a conversation, ask her about it. I think that's yeah, maybe think she doesn't care that she doesn't have a lot of friends. Yeah, maybe she does. I mean, we don't know. I don't know if that was helpful, Amy. Well, you know, I think that this again is a safe space, and yeah. I mean, it's like you say in your videos, straight to the point. Straight so to the point. Th there's no use in sugarcoating or beating around the bush. No, and I mean, I, you know, again, I, I, I hear all these great questions and I think of all these great, you know, narratives and cases coming and I, I would love to see people in, come in so that I can, um, you know, really get into this with them and, um, and really make it happen. And you have great long sessions too. I do. It's not like you're in and out in 30 minutes. They're 90 minute sessions, that, correct? That's correct. Um, my initial sessions are an hour and 45 minutes. Okay. So... You know, people hate and going to a therapist for the first time. They get maybe 45, 50 minutes. That's it. And they don't even get half the story out. And a lot of times therapists are doing, they do all these heavy intakes, which I can't stand. Um, and then the whole session's taken up just taking intakes, you know, from whatever they did when they were five years old and they're now 40. So, yeah. I get in and deal with the immediate problem that brought you to therapy. And then if we have to get to the other stuff down the road, we can. But I want you to get immediate relief. So I give an hour and 45 minutes, almost two hours, the first time you come in. So for a lot of these questions, it might be one two-hour session and that's it. You don't need to come back. Or it might be something that, you know, needs to be, you know, ongoing. But I'm not, I'm very liberal when it comes to how often people come in. Um, you know, some therapists, oh, you have to be here every week. No, you don't. I mean, in today's life is busy. Um, I do 90-minute sessions. I think every other week is, is good enough. It's great if you can come every week. It's fabulous because then, you know, we really get it. But it's not, it's not always possible. Um, you know, people have kids and busy schedules. So I do extra long sessions. Um, you know, another thing somebody asked me, I was away over the weekend, and I handed them my card. And they said, well, what does actuation mean? And I, it ensued, this big conversation ensued about, well, we don't understand what actuation is. Is it a kind of therapy? What does it mean? So I just want to clear up that actuation is the name of my business, okay? Actuation counseling is the name of my business. And actuation means to put something in motion or to make something happen. So if you think, I want to actuate my dream. You want to make your dream happen. I want to actuate my bank account to the highest it can be you know you you want to make things happen so actuation is putting something in motion making things happen so when you come in my goal is to help you actuate your goals help you make things happen in your life put things into motion towards your goal so that's why i call my business actuation if anybody was wondering well, i think it's a great name thank you <laughs> and i think too if there's anybody out there that watches these videos um and that comes in and and sees elizabeth and you want to share your stories or you want to share how she helped you make a positive impact and you're okay with that she's okay with seeing that on her page too i think sometimes oh, yeah. it'll help other people yes. to kind of come out of their shell and to come in and see hey 
you know, she has made a positive difference. This isn't just talk. I That's mean, right. She's, she's had lots of great clients and lots of positive outcomes. Yes, I have. And I, I attribute that um, to the relationship that we build together. It's a, it's a two-way street. It's not just because of me. And, it, and it's not just the client. I mean, it's both of us together. We create a, a, a beautiful relationship. And my clients are like my family mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, you know, some clients you get closer to than others, but um, you know, you're part of the actuation family when you come here. And you know, I still keep in touch with clients from six, seven years ago. So it's, it's great. You, she really takes the time to invest. I, I think do. that's and you're not sitting again there's no desk here mm -mm. not a whole bunch of books she doesn't sit there with a timer or a notebook and never once does she utter how does that make you feel no <laughs> which I, I think is so I will not ask that question because <laughs> so important to put out there for people because we already know how you feel <laughs> that's like, why you're here <laughs> like crap or you wouldn't be here <laughs> um but we even try to have some laughs and um you know it's not all doom and gloom when you come here um and I think that you know, giving these long sessions and, and getting right into the problem is part of what makes actuation counseling effective. Because like I said, I'm not going to kick you out of here when you've just started telling me your name. And I'm not going to ask you a thousand questions about, you know, your whole life. I want to know why are we here? It's a qu I ask everyone on their first session, what are we doing here today? Why are we here? Let's get right to it. And then from there, that tends to open up a lot of possibilities and a lot of opportunities for conversation. I think that's great. Yeah. So um, any any last questions before we go? I don't see anything. I no, think we're, we got them all. I think we're good. Yeah, I think we're We did we're it. Good. Yeah. We did it. High five. Number three, guys. And last week I had, no, two weeks ago. I had a uh, stomach flu and a fever, so if it seemed kind of lame two weeks ago, I apologize. And thank you, Tia, for coming out and being near me when I was so sick. Of course. Um, it was a rough week. I know there's a lot of flu and stuff that's been going yeah, around. Yeah, but you pulled it together and you still did. It was still a great so, show. I don't know. It was okay. I hope it was informative. But this feels so much better today. I feel like myself. And, and we're I've closer. Seen, yes, <laughs> we're sitting very close. So, um, well, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Tia, for being here. You're such a valuable part of this process and um, I hope everybody enjoyed and we'll share this and share it on your pages and um, you can check me out on YouTube I post all my videos on my YouTube channel I'm on Facebook almost every day Instagram every day and hopefully this week we're gonna be yes, Twittering Twitter as well <laughs> that's coming we're getting there um, so everyone have a wonderful week. If you want to reach me, you can reach me um, at 412-376-7322. It's my office phone. And you can email me on any of the social media outlets. Um, you can you know, message me, text me, whatever. And I will get back to you as soon as possible. And my email is eliztherapist at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank day. You.